If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution at lptv.org. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. I'm Rachel Johnson and thanks for joining us. Tonight on Common Ground we visit a momentous period in Minnesota history. We're taking you back to the early days of logging at the Forest History Center in Grand Rapids. This family-oriented historic site recreates the everyday life in a logging camp with everything from real horse-powered skidding right down to the flapjack breakfast. Hello, I'm Becky Jennings. Welcome to the Forest History Center in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. We're one of 26 historic sites that are operated by the Minnesota Historical Society. Today you happen to be here on a Saturday and we're celebrating a couple of different special events which we do throughout the summer season for our guests. We happen to be celebrating our wild edibles program today as well as music and tall tales in the logging camp. The Forest History Center was a brainchild of the Minnesota Historical Society and a gentleman by the name of Robert Wheeler who wanted to capture the flavor, the ideas behind northern Minnesota and the logging industry that occurred when they were clear cutting white pine in northern Minnesota circa 1900. A lot of oral interviews had been done, a lot of research had been done and therefore they had a lot of written word and text and then came the decision as to whether or not to leave it in that form and leave it in an archival form so that people of Minnesota could research and read about that important history of Minnesota or whether or not to make it what we now know as a living history site. Powers it be, after many discussions I'm sure, decided that Grand Rapids, Minnesota would be a perfect spot to build a living history museum. So out here what we have is a 1900 White Pine Logging Camp, a 1901 River Wanigan, which is a replica of a craft that was used on log drives in the spring of the year. And we also have a 1934 Minnesota Forest Service Cabin, where we help folks to take a look back at the type of logging that was done when they were clear cutting old growth forests in Minnesota and the new thoughts that were occurring during that era about reforestation, about the Civilian Conservation Corps, and about moving forward with our forest in Minnesota. One of the messages the Forest History Center would like people to walk away with is that we want to connect people to forests past, present, and future. We do that in many ways. We do that through our living history programs. We do that through the exhibits in our visitor center, which is open year round. We also do that through our educational programs. Our logging camp is our core field trip program for school children and in the month of May we generally see between four and five thousand school children here at the Forest History Center. Our summer season then we roll into summer and welcome guests not only from Minnesota, not only the United States but from all over the world who are curious about our culture, curious about where we came from and certainly wanting to reconnect with forests. We also, in the wintertime, through the use of our visitor center and the naturalists that we have here at the Forest History Center, provide forest adventure programming, which is educational programming for children from preschool all the way through sixth grade. Okay, Philip. Philip, look at me and say hi. 
Good job. Um, I'm chopping down cheese. Oh, is that what you're doing? As part of the Minnesota Historical Society, one of our first priorities is education and children. We do that in many ways, but here at the Forest History Center in our exhibits, we do that by engaging children head-on and inviting them to use all of their senses while they're here. They're not passive, they don't walk by things, but rather they are engaged by touching, by smelling, by using tools or using things that maybe they've never seen before in their lives. And that opens up doors to other avenues of learning for them, other ways of seeing the world around them. And it's done not only here at the Forest History Center, but throughout the Minnesota Historical Society, quite frankly. Through the living history areas out here, our logging camp, children have an opportunity with supervision to take a two-man cross-cut saw, grab the end of a handle, and learn you just pull, you never push. But they're able to cut logs down in the logging camp. They're able to see draft animals up close and personal when they're here. Now, folks my age probably grew up with a lot of that around them. Today's children don't have that opportunity as much. And so as I've worked here for the last 20 some years, I've seen a great change in our audience and how they perceive things. One of the greatest things that I enjoy out here is when I hear a child saying to their parents, I don't want to leave yet. I think it's quite the moment when you see a child that has spent a day at a museum and then doesn't want to leave. What we're doing is engaging children, helping them to understand that these are places they want to be, these are places of learning, these are places that'll enhance and increase their life, and as they move forward, they'll just find it better and better. One of the greatest things that I enjoy out here is real horsepower. We partner with the North Star Draft Horse Association. Last year for real horsepower, the North Star Draft Horse Association brought out 24 draft animals. They brought out some teamsters and they did demonstrations on skidding, sleigh loading and jammer loading. It's a wonderful program and we certainly hope that you consider coming out for that as well. I'm Knut, uh, the barn boss here at the Forest History Center. 
Today we have horsepower days. We've brought in 18 horses in here to work to do skidding demonstrations. They're all members of the North Star Draft Horse Association, all friends that come here and volunteer to do this. The demonstrations that are going on here today will be log skidding, cross haul loading, and jammer loading with the horses. The team I have here standing with me are a pair of Belgians. They are Bud and Duke, and they are the cross haul team here today. Explain to him that he doesn't jump on this one, hey, you don't have and to he jump. better not crawl under. Oh, no, no, no. Hey, hey, instead of having that one thing rolling. The event started about six years ago here, uh, bringing in the horses, and we do it on the last Saturday in August. What it does, it gives an opportunity for the locals or anyone coming through to stop on the last Saturday of August here to see what a 1900 logging camp would be like, full of horses, with all of the stuff that the Teamsters would have did with their horses, plus they get the full tour of the camp, they get to see the cook shack, they go in there, they see food being cooked. It's uh, the one day out of the year that you'll be able to come here to the Forest History Center and see about every activity there is to go on. and uh, the bunkhouse. We've got music playing today. We're at Northwoods number one logging camp and you are in the bunkhouse or the sleep camp or the ram's pasture if you will where I've got room to lay their heads down 72 little lambs in here. And the bull cook, which today I am, I would assign bunks when the fellas came in. You want to put the teamsters closer to the door because they get woken up early so they can go take care of the horses. And the more status you had, maybe the, the better spots you had. Not that real close to the stove was a good spot because that got pretty hot. So, And usually the bull cook, actually they just do chores around the camp. So whether it's an old timer like me or maybe Maybe in some cases a younger younger fella that didn't have a lot of experience, but so doing chores. Firewood was a big one. Cutting, hauling, splitting, firewood, keeping all the fires in the camp going. Taking the noon meal out to the men, hooking up a horse to the swing dingle and taking that out, or washing towels and aprons for the cook shack every Sunday. Waking the men up in the morning, daylight in the swamp. Roll out your burning daylight! Anyway, some of the things that a bull cook would do. Back in the olden days when they had oxen in the camp, that was the job to cook the, the mash or the oxen. Because for some reason they, they can't digest it as easy unless it's cooked up. So even though you see no oxen anymore here, and very few in 1900, the name just stuck, just like names tend to stick, don't they? Well, now this here is not only a place where the fellas sleep, but it's also what you might call the social hall. But it being Saturday and all, we don't work on Sundays for the most time, and so we're going to have a dance here tonight. Come all you good fellows who like to hear fun. Come listen to me and I'll sing you a song. Listen to me and the truth I'll declare For I'll sing to you of Pokegama Bear 
Twas a cold, frosty morning, the winds how they blew. We went out to the woods for our day's work to do. Out to the woods we did quickly repair. Twas there that we met the Pokegama bear. Now Morris O'Hearn, twas a bold Irish lad. He was building a fire out in the pine wood. He rapped with his axe when he got there, and out jumped the monstrous Pokegama bear. With the roar of a lion, O'Hearn he did swear, run boys for God's sakes now, cause I found a bear. When out from the brush, old Jim Quinn, he did climb. Said to hell with the bear, kill your own porcupine. Anyway, <laughs> that was a poem that this Frank Hasty wrote in 1890 something or other about a bear in a wood camp near here, you know, Pokegama Lake, and he named it the Pokegama Bear. So it's kind of fun to read a poem that was actually written in that time. And I threw some music to it. I'm sure it's the same tune that there's hundreds of other songs, but... Well, there's only so much you can read in a book, only so much you can see on the television. But you come out here, you can, you can smell what it's like to be out here, whether you're in the cook shack or the barn. You can feel whatever you like to feel. You can see all different types of things. You can hear music, you can hear interpretations. So I think that's it, and, and it, not that far removed from maybe what your grandfather, your great-grandfather might have experienced when they came to this part of the country. Sure. The logging of the white pine started in the east, and as it moved across the country, coming across, when we got into eastern Ohio and into Michigan, Horses were starting to get brought over here. The Percheron was the first horse to come over about 12 hairs ahead of the other breeds. So they started using horses, and when they started using horses over oxen, they almost doubled production of putting it out. They were a little more expensive to feed and take care of, but the production that they were putting out was worth the expense. So oxen went a little bit to the wayside. Not that they weren't bad, it was just that it was faster and they were looking at building America. They wanted this lumber. Everybody was wanting lumber. They were building towns. They were settling this country. So that's why the horses come into play. And the horses kind of took over the logging industry in the north. And uh, as I said, Percherons were the horse of choice at that time because they were the first ones to come. The horses in a logging camp will work six days a week. Uh, providing it doesn't snow or something's wrong that they have to work on Sundays, they do get Sundays off. Their duties is skidding the logs out of the woods to bring them to the landing areas. Their duties are also to run the water tank to be able to ice the roads down because we have to ice roads to be able to move big loads. We have cross all horses for loading the sleighs and jammer horses to run that. We also use the horses to pull the sleighs down to the river. In our case, we move our logs to the river. And later in the spring, when the water is high in the river and they can start the log drive, horses will be used again after they can't roll the logs any farther into the river by hand. Horses will use, be used again to skid the logs down to the bank to be rolled into the river. So the horses have many duties. They have to help build the camp, move from camp to camp. So without our horses, we can't get the job done and help build America. Each horse is going to eat approximately 30 pounds of hay uh, every day. Uh, we feed oats according to their weight. We feed a quart of oats for 100 pounds of weight. Uh, on an average, 17 and a half quarts of oats that horses are going to get every day. We use oats because it's higher in energy. We don't need the horses real fat. We just need them in good shape and the energy and stuff. We feed them hay. After the horses leave the barn, as the barn boss, my real work starts then. I gotta get that barn cleaned. I gotta get the bedding all back down. I gotta get hay ready for them. Horses are also fed their grain three times a day. So at noon when the men have their break, 
the horses also get their dinner. Good job, Hannah. It's wonderful we'll stepping over that. <laughs> Most people today in modern times see a load of wood going down the road and don't realize where it comes from. When they come out here to the logging camp and see how it was done in the 1900s, basically it is still done that way today, except machines do it instead of men. A lot of the inventions, a lot of things that they used and come up with back in that time are still in use. They're just a little bit more modern today. And a lot of people don't understand that. We were the forerunners to just about everything you use today. A couple of samples, for instance, to say frame jammer over here. We use it with cables. We use it for men to swing it. The modern one will have an engine that runs it. will be operated with hydraulics, but it's still going to lift the logs and do it the same as it is. They can do it more efficient and a lot faster than what we do today. But that's where the design or this idea come from that we're doing it with horses. Let's do it with machines now. Same way with skidding logs. The skidders skid the logs the same as what the horses did. It's just that it's all automatic. They can pull levers and do the job. They don't have to get down and do the physical work that we did in 1900. So basically it's still the same as what we did then with just a little bit easier equipment to do it with. I feel history is very important and uh, to tell the young folks of what it was like, how our country got settled. This country was covered with pine and trees and there wasn't much, you know, no settlements and this was a part of the settlements being made when we talk about the logging that goes on of, from the 1900s and uh, getting it here, that's why railroads come into the community to start settling this community, to start helping move logs out. Uh, it's just a, it's a very important, if we didn't know where we come from, we don't know where we're going. Here at the Forest History Center, we feel that it's very necessary and a very worthy cause to educate people about the people and the past who came before us, how they have affected our lives today, and as we go about living our busy, fast-paced lives, it's very easy to forget all of the hard work, all of the toil, all of the men and women who came before homesteading these lands, cutting timber to create America. Connecting people to those forests in this manner gives people a sense of who they are and brings us back to our real roots. We also do this in ways with our naturalists. Our naturalists, for example, here today doing our wild edible program, have taken master naturalist courses. And so we find there's a great interest in our community that we serve to find out about the natural landscape around them. Northern Minnesota in particular, in my mind, has this vast bounty of state lands, of government lands, federal lands, and some privately owned lands, obviously. And a multitude of things growing on them. People want to know about the trees that they have on their land, how to harvest them. People want to know about the wild edibles on their land and the wild plants on their property. The Forest History Center is one of many resources that are available to people to find out about those specific subjects. The program that you're seeing today is Wild Edibles, and it's a program that Judy Sutherland and I do. And what we're doing is we take people that are interested in seeing, gathering, and preparing the wild edibles. So we get some sampling, get an idea of what we're going to look for. We see a short slide program in order to get some visuals, and then we actually go out and see what we can come across. So we're going to go for a walk, see what we can find. Sometimes we'll gather, we'll sample. If it's edible, raw, we'll get a chance to do that. But we just go out and try to show everyone a little bit of what's available. A real common thing to gather and, and eat or try is wood sorrel. Grows in most everyone's yard. It's got a nice lemony flavor. It's kind of interesting, so you know you can just go pick it and eat it. Cattails in the spring are exciting, just because it's spring. And then the my my favorite item to gather in the spring early are the fiddlehead ferns, because there again it's spring's coming. It's the first of the, of the greens that's available, and they have a really good flavor. The Forest History Center is offering this program to enhance the existing programs that we have on our site. Because we're gathering from the forest, 
that kind of makes sense that would fit in with the forest history. A big question that, that we'll get is, you know, a lot of times, what does something taste like? Well, it tastes like what it is, so that's important. But also remember that when you gather, know what you're gathering. So that's a big part of this program, is we try to help you learn what to gather, what's safe, what's not. Also, some of our wilds can be over-harvested, so we talk about that. We offer two classes. We offer one in the spring, one in the fall. So if you want to get signed, and we have to have you sign up, if you want to get signed up for one of those classes, you contact the Forest History Center at 327-4483, that's our phone number, or you can check our website at, at mnhs.org slash forest history. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Common Ground. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. To view this episode or any Common Ground segment, visit us at lptv.org. individual segments or entire episodes of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people on November 4, 2008. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org. <laughs>